We are going to get started. I said on our IHL events, I feel like very stressed to make sure that we start on military time. Plus all of our collaboration with the ICRC, they're Swiss, they start on time too. But we're at WCL, so we're starting late, um, which is fine. I also want to just draw to your attention, because we didn't make the announcement earlier today, that just outside the door, we are um, having a small fundraising campaign um, to help with disaster relief in Japan. Um, we're very mindful and very thoughtful as, as other events have overtaken media attention, um, things going on in Libya and elsewhere, um, that the disaster in Japan continues. And um, it's a, it's a, it, it continues and worsens, actually. And so the proceeds that are raised outside are going to go to the American Red Cross to help with relief in Japan and the Pacific. And so we hope that you will um, uh, participate and, and help to support the folks who are really struggling to recover um, in that region. Also, just as a small note, Japanese Tokyo Television is out doing a piece on this uh, right now. And so the news of this effort will be transferred back to Tokyo, which we are, are happy and grateful for as a show of support um, to the people there. So uh, I'm going to ask Dick Jackson to come and to introduce our keynote speaker of the day. Thank you. Thanks. It's really my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Dave Crane. Uh, Dave and I have been following each other around for too many years to mention, uh, really. Um, we, we're both uh, veterans of the U.S. Army JAG Corps, but we're, we're also both veterans of the uh, Special Forces community. We, we were uh, um, attorneys for U.S. Army Special Opera in U.S. Army Special Operations Command um, over the course of our careers and uh, spent a lot of time working with the, the soft folks. In fact, uh, uh, Dave, Dave um, and I have, have uh, followed each other around to the point that um, when he was leaving the, uh, the JAG school as the chair of the International Law Department, he called me up and said, how'd you like to replace me on the, uh, at the JAG school and teach as the, at, as the chair of the International Law Department? So he recruited me to go there, and, and I really, really appreciate that. That was a great, great experience. And uh, now... Uh, my career has kind of stayed on an even tra trajectory, but Dave's instead went kind of mercurial um, after that. Um, Dave uh, went and began working for the uh, DOD IG and was um, the, the uh, senior legal counsel for DOD IG um, and, a, and a senior executive service um, employee. See, I'm a GS-15, just like uh, thousands of them in the Pentagon. Um, and then after that, um, in, from 2002 to 2005, he was the founding uh, chief prosecutor for the Sierra Leone Tribunal, a, a UN employee um, seconded from the U.S. Uh, government who, who was supporting this, this hybrid uh, tribunal. Um, and since that time, he's been teaching at, uh, the, at Syracuse University uh, Law School. And... Uh, and and uh, I've attended a number of his presentations on um, the tribunal on international uh, criminal law and, uh, and the law of armed conflict. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that um, you have in store for you a uh, fascinating discussion uh, about those topics. Uh, with any further, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor David Crane. Thanks, Dick. I appreciate uh, those kind words. And as I'm sitting here reflecting on how many, uh, sure, dare I say, decades that we've known each other, uh, it, uh, time certainly moves on. Uh, before I go into uh, my talk, which is entitled Dead or Alive, uh, Reflections on International Humanitarian Law in an Age of Extremes, uh, of course, I do want to thank uh, the sponsors of, uh, of this effort and really commend them uh, for this effort. Uh, American University College of Law itself, uh, uh, Dean Claudio Grossman, uh, really is a, is a cutting edge dean who allows these important programs and efforts to go in, on his law school. Uh, certainly, I also want to uh, uh, really commend the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law, 
uh, Susanna Sakuto, a longtime friend who I've known and who we've worked together in, in West Africa, uh, needs to be acknowledged. And of course, certainly the American Society for International Law, who's also a sponsor in uh, an organization that I have uh, been dealing with for, for many, many years as well. And of course, then uh, the Lieber Society on the Law of Armed Conflict, uh, Colonel Dick Jackson, uh, I have the privilege of being on the executive board of the Lieber Society. More importantly, though, I do want to congratulate the uh, competition winners. I had the privilege of being uh, one of the final judges. So, Robert, uh, congratulations to you again. A very impressive effort, I might add. And, of course, to Elizabeth, who I understand is on her honeymoon in Italy, which is the right place to be, absolutely. Uh, what I want to do here today, uh, we have a great discussion. You had a great discussion this morning. Is kind of put in to a historical context uh, where we have been, where we are, and where we're going in international humanitarian law. And having been a Cold Warrior, someone who really fought the Cold War more than anything else, uh, watching the development of various aspects of international humanitarian law from both an international perspective as well as a United States uh, perspective. So we'll, we'll consider the 20th century itself, what I call the bloody century. Uh, then we'll pause in the middle of that century and consider the bright and shining four years, as I call it, uh, where we actually develop a cornerstone by which we do our business today. Then we'll consider the Cold War and the impact the Cold War had on international humanitarian law and, frankly, international criminal law. Uh, then we'll pause, stop, and then we'll consider what's happened uh, after 9-11, and then we'll conclude. Let's talk about the, the bloody century, the 20th century. Uh, I teach atrocity law and policy as one of my portfolio subjects at Syracuse University College of Law, and I've been doing some, some number crunching, so to speak, and I could be off on these numbers uh, by as much as 25 percent, but during the 20th century, over 225 million human beings died of non-natural causes, and of those, 115 million died at the hands of their own governments, uh, a truly horrific time frame. Being an historian myself, I understand that uh, there's been other bloody periods in mankind's history, but this is extraordinary. Uh, in the modern era, we have these kinds of numbers. You know, from King Leopold II uh, of Belgium and the horror of the Congo, uh, he uh, today would have been individually criminally liable uh, for the destruction of over 10 to 15 million Congolese. All the way through to Adolf Hitler, uh, Joseph Stalin, who uh, would be responsible for the destruction of over 34 million uh, citizens of his country. Of course, Mao Zedong, the premier mega murderer of uh, 64 million human beings during his horrific reign. And of course, then all the other heads of state during this 20th century period. Now, during the 20th century, we had some customary law of war. I mean, the, the concept of, of humanity on the battlefield did exist. And of course, certainly we had uh, uh, the important Hague Rules of 1907, which really, frankly, are the cornerstone even today, even in the challenges that we have today, are, are so important. And in my mind, and someone who has is, is both been a special operations uh, officer at the cutting edge of, uh, of, uh, of the spear, the pointy end of the spear, so to speak, all the way to teaching it and advising commanders around the world on these important subjects, and of course, obviously, prosecuting those uh, who uh, uh, committed horrific acts, war crimes, and crimes against humanity uh, in Sierra Leone. Uh, military necessity, the concept of military necessity that came out of The Hague, really still today is the cornerstone of how we should approach uh, uh, international humanitarian law. If it's, there's no military necessary reason to do what you're about to do, or as Russell Crowe said in the beginning of the movie Gladiator, unleash hell. Uh, we need to pause and make sure that what we're doing, uh, at least for our forces or forces engaged in whatever conflict it may be, that they understand. And of course, military necessity. Of course, I appreciate unnecessary suffering, discrimination, distinction, uh, and all the rest. But I think that really military necessity is a cornerstone of how, uh, if we do in fact use kinetic energy, if we do use force, uh, once we have the lawful basis to use it, military necessity still remains, I think, a very important concept. But I'm not telling you anything. You understand that. Uh, so here we have the 
bloody 20th century. But in the middle of all of this, in the middle of all of this, uh, we have these bright and shining four years. Uh, right after World War II, uh, the world paused and said, where are we going with this? And we had made attempts early on in the 1920s after World War I, the League of Nations and those sorts of, uh, the concept of the world getting together to maybe settle their disputes peacefully. Uh, and also the concept of, is war really necessary in the kellogg Bryan Pact? But it took World War II and the horror of that particular event where over 55 million human beings died or were casualties of that particular conflict for the world to stop and do certain things which to this day are significant and important for us. And of course, the first portion of those bright and shining four years is the International Military Tribunal uh, at Nuremberg. And the Nuremberg principles where we see uh, the world saying we're not going to just go out and uh, execute individuals who bore the greatest responsibility for the horror. We're going to submit them to the rule of law and let judges based on facts and law decide. And of course that was a pretty bold and cutting edge idea. Uh, during those time frames. In fact, the individuals who went to Nuremberg and worked for Robert H. Jackson uh, really put their, li uh, their lives, uh, professional lives, on the line. Many of them are young, not much younger uh, than you. Uh, they were incredibly young. Uh, Henry T. King was 26 years old, uh, who went to Nuremberg, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they went over there. People were telling him uh, at Yale Law School, don't go there. Uh, this is victor's justice. This is going to turn into something that will forever mark your career. So it took a lot of uh, courage, uh, both physical courage and emotional courage and professional courage, uh, to move forward. And see, when we come out of Nuremberg, of course, we see the prosecution of war crimes, crimes against humanity. Uh, even the concept of aggression uh, was considered. These principles were the foundation 40 years later to what we call now modern international criminal law. And we'll talk more about that uh, in a few moments. Also, we see after the uh, International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg, we see the UN Charter and the incredible concept. We tend to forget this, but the incredible concept that mankind should dis settle their disputes peacefully. You know, that seems like a trite phrase, but that's so important and again, uh, the UN paradigm that we have today, the cornerstone of that particular concept of settling our disputes peacefully, uh, sets the tone as to when we actually use force and the just basis for that use of force. Of course, also we had another amazing document which we tend to push aside as well, and that is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, I think of these particular documents that I'm talking about, one of the premier legal documents. Because what does the Universal Declaration of Human Rights really say? It says that, again, for the first time in history, that when you're born, you have a right to be. You have a right to live a life to its natural end. That seems okay. In America, we kind of take that for granted in other Western nations. But the idea that everyone born has a right to exist. Granted, I'm being a little simplistic, but that really, if you think about it, is what we're really talking about here. Very, very important, particularly in, I, in my work as the chief prosecutor at an international tribunal, that was important. Uh, that resonated when you were developing uh, your cases. And of course, then we also have the Genocide Convention, where mankind took one particular act, one particular horrific act, uh, and said, never again, no more. And of course, we'll talk more about this a little bit later because that's starting to become problematic and an idea that I call semantic indifference. And we'll discuss that. And certainly, hopefully, we may be able to discuss that during a question and answer period if we have time after my talk. And then we had, of course, the Geneva Conventions of 1949. Now, we obviously had these types of protections uh, throughout the 20th century, but this is where we really had the world truly step up and codify the protections that we rely on today. And that's also very, very important. You know, truly, 
uh, making sure that those found on the battlefield uh, are protected, the sick and wounded, prisoners of war, civilians, what have you. As importantly, the Geneva Conventions, as you well know, and I highlight these things because we tend to step over it, it requires us to respect those protections. It places a duty on signatories to respect them. When you are prosecuting somebody for war crimes and crimes against humanity, that's an important practical and legal argument before a tribunal. Regardless, all parties to an international or an internal armed conflict now have to respect those rules. And that's very, very important. As importantly is that there's also that obligation, which we don't see very much up until 1949, and that is to investigate allegations of war crimes and to prosecute those who commit those war crimes or to turn over to someone who's willing to do so. So that sets the standard. You have to respect those rules. You have to protect those individuals. If you do not, in whatever form that evolves, then there's an obligation to investigate and prosecute. And that's, again, the cornerstone of modern international criminal law. 1945, 1949. What happened also during this time frame? The Iron Curtain fell across Eastern Europe, and frankly, we had a black and white situation. The world split itself politically, and this was almost the death knell of all of these wonderful principles that I had just briefly reviewed. Because at this point in time, we see that regardless of what you were doing with your own people, as long as you were on our side, we allowed you to do whatever you wanted to do. And so he, you may be an SOB, but you're our SOB, all right? And so as long as you are uh, non-communist, keeping your people in check, uh, suppressing any kind of thought process related to socialism, uh, we're going to bolster you, protect you, and keep you in the fold. Now, we are living right now, as I speak, in a fascinating final unraveling of the Cold War, if you think about this. And that is all of these propped up individuals throughout the Middle East who were very much on our side, and individuals were moderate uh, Muslim nations, Sunni mainly, uh, started in the middle of the Cold War. And we needed them in order to keep the Middle East calm and outside of the mutually assured destruction death grip that we had with the Soviet Union. Also, uh, they had oil, lots of oil. And as long as they were on our side, that was strategically very, very important to the West, as particularly the United States. Well, now, after, my goodness, dare I say it, 21 years, 20 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, these final tyrants, thugs, kings, presidents, whatever you want to call them, uh, we have a group of individuals, young people, saying, you know, I like this idea of freedom. And we'll talk more about this, about challenges, a little bit later on in my talk. So it's a fascinating period of history uh, in the 20th century. The last half of it was a strange political, geopolitical situation where we allowed people to run amok, both sides, Soviet side as well as the Western side. This wasn't just clearly West. And we were willing to look the other way uh, as these tyrants, thugs, kings, presidents, whatever they were called, really fed on their own people. So modern international humanitarian law, modern international criminal law just went nascent in many, many respects. And so this is a real challenge. And then when the wall came down and this, quote, new world order began, uh, we weren't sure where it was going. There was a lot of hope, 
uh, but we'll talk more about what happened next. The bottom line is, is that uh, the principles at Nuremberg, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, all of these principles that we talked about uh, went dormant because we were more interested geopolitically to ensure uh, that we checkmated uh, the Soviet Union and what was going on there. During this time frame, frankly, after all of this bright and shining moment, those four years from 1945 to 1949, the majority of civilians killed at the hands of their own government took place. About 75 million human beings died at the hands of their own government after all of these legal principles were put in place that certainly uh, called for some type of justice for them. But were we going to go into China and stop Mao Zedong uh, in the 1970s? Were we going to take on the Soviet Union on a human rights particular point? Absolutely not. Frankly, we're not going to do that again today as well, and we'll talk more about those challenges a little bit later. The Cold War ends, and we see then the advent of a new dawn, or what we thought was a new dawn. In reality, within two years of the wall coming down, we have uh, the Balkan tragedy that takes place. We have the Rwandan massacre a few months later. And then also going on at the same time, this is the 1990s, this is the turn of the new millennium, we have a very, very uncivil war going on in West Africa as well as other places. The world had the ability at this point to take all of those nascent principles of 1945 and 1949 and move them forward to take on the challenges of the Balkan War. And with that, we see, since Nuremberg, the very first international criminal tribunal for the former Yugoslavia which moved forward some of the principles that we find at, at Nuremberg, moved forward the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, moved forward the United Nations Declaration of Principles, and moved forward the Geneva Conventions as well as the Genocide Convention, and began the process of what we now call modern international criminal law. We were forced to deal with these horrific acts. And shortly after that, we see the Rwandan tragedy, where we truly see, since World War II, uh, a horrific genocide uh, taking place. Now, from these, and of course, during the civil war in, in, in Sierra Leone and West Africa, we also see uh, the world pausing and stepping forward to stop these kinds of horrors and to seek justice for the many, uh, many victims. And then turning to the Asia, we began to see an attempt to consider uh, what was going on in the killing fields uh, in the 1970s, which could not be ignored. So today we have the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. Uh, it's not a pretty thing, but it is some attempt by mankind uh, to seek justice for the victims uh, in the 1970s horror uh, that was the killing fields. Modern international criminal law has been around now for about 15 years, and the advances have been frankly, extraordinary. I certainly am not going to say it's been perfect. Uh, it certainly has been expensive. It's been frustrating. But if you look at it from the pure concept of advancing the rule of law forward, uh, they have been very, very important. Uh, what we see as a result of these early tribunals and courts is the end of head of state immunity. We actually prosecute heads of state, sitting heads of state, for violations of international norms and law. Ten years ago, that was a theory. That was a concept. And now we, maybe inartfully at times, take on heads of state for what they have done as heads of state, as they are sitting as heads of state, as we did against Charles Taylor uh, in Liberia. We also see uh, that the UN Security Council and the United Nations itself stepping forward and taking the lead. Maybe not pretty, but certainly stepping forward uh, when they were really needed to create many of these courts and tribunals. We see the end of general amnesty. Of course, 
way we, we dealt with heads of state before uh, modern international criminal law is we put them in exile. You know, Napoleon, et cetera, et cetera, Idi Amin. Uh, there was even an urge to move Charles Taylor and just put him in exile. Now, there's discussions as we speak, probably secret, of course, but what are we going to do with my good friend Muammar Gaddafi, who was very much involved in West Africa as well, and actually created the blood diamond story. We can talk about that in questions and answers. Uh, but I am sure that politicians, cynical politicians and diplomats, are discussing uh, if we give him an amnesty, will he walk away? Despite the referral of what he's doing to his people uh, by the Security Council to uh, my good friend Luis Marino Ocampo related to uh, crimes against humanity, and frankly, I would say that we're now raising a level of war crimes as well. So we're still evolving here. Uh, the reaction of a diplomat or a politician is, yeah, international criminal law is good, and enforcing the law is important, but if we can get this guy out of here uh, in an agreement, uh, so much the better, because it creates a much an easier uh, political solution to what is really becoming uh, a really sticky situation. Also, we see finally, because it really wasn't addressed and litigated in Nuremberg, gender crimes. This is incredibly important. Uh, the victims of these horror stories, particularly after the fall of the wall, but even during the time of the Cold War, it was women and children that bore the brunt of these horror stories. And so these courts and tribunals advance the concept of gender crimes to where now it is a recognized jurisprudential point. Uh, all prosecutors, all my colleagues, uh, consider gender crimes an important part of their investigations. They don't step over those types of crimes and they go after those individuals who commit gender crimes. The cornerstone of my indictments in West Africa were gender crimes. I wanted to make sure that the world understood how important it is that we don't push aside women and the horrors that they go through moving forward into the 21st century. They had to know about the bushwives of Sierra Leone. So this was very, very important. We see also uh, that uh, uh, rape as a tool of genocide in the Akiesu case, the first glimmer of hope related to gender crimes. Up to that point, even the ICTY was really not pursuing gender crimes to the extent that they are now. Uh, at the early days, there was very little discussion of gender crimes. At Nuremberg, there were no gender crimes charged. In Cambodia, uh, very few gender crimes uh, charged. So again, we had to step forward into the 21st century to ensure that the world understood uh, the horrors that were being perpetrated against women and girls uh, in these situations. In the bushwife phenomenon, 35,000 or so women and girls driven into the bush, traded, branded, uh, bred, worked, and were no longer of use, put down like pack animals. Uh, that's not rape. That's not just sexual slavery. That's a different crime. And so I remember one Friday afternoon, I brought all my prosecutors and senior investigators together in a round table, and we just sat and talked and saying, we've already indicted all these individuals. And so we were thinking of amending the leadership of the Revolutionary United Front and the leadership of the Civil Defense Force and the leadership of the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council uh, on some other crime. What do we call this? Well, fortunately, uh, we had in our statute uh, the concept of other inhumane acts. And so what we finally decided to do was call this forced marriage in times of armed conflict and literally created, frankly, a new crime against humanity using the rubric of other inhumane acts. And so we sought amendment to their indictments. Uh, it was granted and certainly litigated, but at the end of the day, uh, forced marriage in times of armed conflict uh, is a, re a recognized crime against humanity. And so we were able to go after those individuals uh, who particularly uh, created this, this terrible situation. 
many of the bush wives still remain uh, in the bush. We also see the scourge of child soldiers, a particularly uh, modern phenomenon, though children have been in combat since a thousand years. But the horror story of child soldiers uh, is something that we're not going to talk about right now. But I was given the legal authority to prosecute individuals who unlawfully recruited children into the armed force under the age of 15. First time ever. And we went after those individuals who did just that. And we were able to investigate, indict, and successfully prosecute those who used child soldiers. Because the conflict in Sierra Leone was particularly terrible in that, in that particular situation. We had over 30,000 child soldiers, an entire generation destroyed uh, as a result. And so we went after those individuals as well. We also see the advent, and a very important point, of this concept of responsibility to protect uh, that is batted around now. And we actually see, for the first time, for all practical purposes, it being used in Operation Odyssey Dawn. But why did they go in with their cruise missiles and their aircraft? It was to protect civilians. So certainly, even though I haven't seen it actually mouthed very much as a concept, Really, what we got here is a responsibility to protect situation. And just simply the fact that we're prosecuting individuals who are individually criminally responsible for the murder, rape, maiming, and mutilation of human beings, for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. We're doing something. It isn't perfect, but we're doing something. And comparing and contrasting the bloody century the 20th century to what we're doing now, we potentially have a hopeful step in the right direction. And now, lastly, we have the creation of a permanent international criminal court that will take all of what we have done in the modern era, the courts and tribunal, and move it forward. So all of these tyrants and thugs and kings and dictators and presidents now live in the shadow of Rome and what took place at Rome. Frankly, though, I think the future of modern international criminal law is not the International Criminal Court. That is a court of last resort. The future of justice for victims of these horrors is domestically. We have to move forward and continue bolstering states' parties and give them the ability to prosecute their own, which dovetails very nicely into the Geneva Convention concept of investigate and prosecute. Uh, we call that the principle of complementarity. Uh, the ICC does not have the ability to prosecute all of these cases even though diplomats and politicians tend to think, well, we can, we can just turn it over to the ICC. Well, they can't. And they weren't set up to do that. They don't have enough money, enough people to investigate and prosecute all of the war crimes and crimes against humanity going on. So the future, the next 30 to 40 years, is domestic law and prosecuting those who commit these crimes within those countries. And so we have to, through great organizations that you have here at the Washington College of Law, et cetera, et cetera, have to train our law students and the next generation in bolstering capacity to prosecute their own. I think that's very, very critical. The one thing I've learned, having been very much involved in this over the past 10 years, is that still the bright red thread of modern international criminal law, and it immediately affects the development of international humanitarian law, is politics, politics, politics. We now have the jurisprudence and the rules of procedure and evidence that have been developed in a solid background. We can legally prosecute anyone that we have jurisdiction over for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. But that's not how it's going to happen. It's going to be a political decision 
by the international community to hand these individuals over at the international level for prosecution. So it was a political decision to hand Charles Taylor over to us for prosecution. It will be a political decision when they hand over Omar al-Bashir to the International Criminal Court. It will be a political decision related to what they decide to do with Muammar Gaddafi if he doesn't leave Libya feet first. Okay? It's political. So the bright red thread of all of this, I think this is important. If you ignore the political aspects of modern prosecutions, you're going to make a mistake. You have to consider the political ramifications of what you're about to do or you will, in fact, suffer the consequences because it's a political world we live in. And so I would just throw that out to you as you consider and as we deal with these situations that really, at the end of the day, it's all about politics. So what are the challenges in what I call this age of apparent extremes? Well, one of the things that is really starting to evolve is, is that we don't have these grand wars, these grand conflicts where we're taking on the imperial Japanese army, where there are lines and there's, uh, it's very apparent. Everybody looks like a good guy or a bad guy. All the combatants are easily identified. The civilians are easily identified. The cause is just and everybody rallies. That is never going to happen again. I don't think we'll be taking on China anytime soon in some classic tank-on-tank -tank battle. I don't think we're going to be taking on Russia in the same situation. What we're going to be seeing, and it's obvious to most of you, is what I call dirty little wars that bite the ankles of the international community and will continue to do so for many, many years ahead. They're largely internal with obvious regional ramifications. There's no clear governance in some situations. It's a Mad Max Thunderdome type situation, very much like what we saw in West Africa. And importantly, there is no adherence to the rule of law and no discussion of international humanitarian law. The combatants on both sides, or certainly on one side, have never heard of it. They're out there doing their thing, whatever that thing is. And the result is, is war crimes, crimes against humanity, maybe genocide uh, on a grand scale. So these are the wars that we're going to have to apply the law that is really, frankly, state-centric and try to overlay that and come up with a just and practical solution to these situations. And civilians are the targets in these dirty little wars. You know, we're not bombing dams, we're not bombing strategic points and oil fields and stuff. We're just killing a lot of civilians to gain some kind of gain, uh, to, geopolitical or practical gain. Civilians are all over. They're caught up in these dirty little wars. So how are we going to deal with civilians? This is really going to be the cornerstone of how we're going to practice law uh, in the next several decades. The incredible rise of non-state actors. I recall back in Operation Desert Storm, we took 75,000 Iraqi prisoners. They look like prisoners. We began following the Geneva Convention 3, processing them, determining, caring for them, putting them in POW cages, but the warring lasted 100 hours. So we didn't quite finish. So what we did is we treated them humanely, gave them food and water, and escorted, the, escorted them back to Iraq. Okay? We're not going to find these types of situations, and we're certainly not finding it uh, certainly in Iraq or Afghanistan or other places. Everybody looks the same. But the rise and the numbers of non-state actors in these dirty little wars, these conflicts, uh, is going to continue to challenge how we apply state-centric, modern, international humanitarian law. I say we can. I disagree with the former commander-in-chief uh, when he said the rules have changed. The rules haven't changed. The rules are just as important. We can apply them. Good lawyers do that. Practical people can do that. Obviously, things have to be tweaked, but the bottom line is the rules don't need to be changed. Let's pause here because I think that it is important that we consider the U.S. response uh, to the 9-11 attacks. You know, we declared war, whatever that was, 
uh, the war on terror, which is frankly a war on a method of warfare, uh, and the rest of the world sat back and said, we consider them criminals. Think how much this would have changed if we would have been, we would consider these terrorists criminals as opposed, and we've been doing this for decades. Uh, we treat them as criminals, we get them, we prosecute them under our law, and we put them in jail if they are guilty. Why declare war on a group of thugs? I think the outcome today would have been slightly different, but we didn't. And so we began to, and, and Americans are good at this, remember the Maine, remember the Alamo, remember Pearl Harbor. And again, I'm not belittling the tragedy of 9-11. I personally lost friends in the, in the Pentagon. The point is, though, is that we have to pause and be very careful as we begin to say things like, dead or alive, they'll have flies on their eyeballs. The Geneva Conventions are quaint. These are not done by a group of angry or concerned citizens over a beer down the street here. Uh, this, these words are actually being mouthed in the Oval Office and down the street in the Attorney General's office. And that's sending signals throughout our particular national command authority and the world is that the U.S. is going to handle this slightly differently. And because of that, the world saw a country that stands for the rule of law who actually helped create modern international humanitarian law begin to shift. And we're still paying the consequences of that, in my opinion. Guantanamo is a legal, practical result of non-state actors in a theater of war. The problem is that's not the problem. It's the allegations uh, that come out of Guantanamo. And of course, Guantanamo has been synonymous with all of the things that the US responded to related to the planes going into the buildings. So we have secret prisons, and we have uh, Bagram Air Force Base, and we have Abu Ghraib, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, there are, the facts are the facts. Some of them skewed. History will tell. But that's not the point. The hit that the United States has taken for at least the perception that we're stepping away from the very principles that we helped champion throughout the Cold War, that we've stepped away from it. And that's a challenge that we're going to be faced with for quite some time as well. Because in my travels as a senior international diplomat, uh, I took a brunt of accusations. I was the only American in the room and I was accused of committing torture and, and, and supporting President Bush, what have you. And I was surprised because I can remember in the Cold War when I was traveling, the Americans used to be the good guys. And now you'd walk in and they go, oh, there's an American. And they jump on you at these diplomatic receptions saying, uh, why are you going to invade the Netherlands? You know, those are, again, I'm being a little facetious here, but that's the kind of the anger and the issues that we were facing when I was uh, traveling at that particular time uh, dealing with and working uh, on issues related to West Africa. So again, the United States of America in certain times became the bad guys. We were the guys with the black hats on, not the white hats. And that was an unusual situation for this American uh, who spent most of his adult life championing the rule of law and ensuring that we follow the rule of law in conflict situations. Other challenges, uh, other than just how the U.S. has handled uh, the 21st century and these new challenges, these dirty little wars, of course, is technology. How fascinating all of this is. I remember when I was the Deputy Inspector General of the Department of Defense uh, going out and seeing this thing called a drone at Fort Hachuca. Then in those days, it was classified top secret. We had three of them in 1995. 96, and they didn't know what to do with them, and they were about ready to close the program because there was no need for them. Eh, we'll use them for counter drug. Maybe we'll fly them over the southwest border, and they can look down and see people moving about with a whole bunch of cocaine or something. But there really was no clear mission. My goodness gracious, we certainly have missions for them now. In fact, uh, 
it's going to be fascinating to see how technology is going to move human beings away from the battlefield and that machines and tools of war uh, that are literally manned by human beings but are independently operating, how that evolves and how we're going to have to deal with certainly the laws of armed conflict related to those situations. We can certainly discuss that this afternoon. Also, the fascinating world of non-lethal weaponry. Uh, back in Somalia, we certainly could have used some of that non-lethal weaponry. I stepped in a little bit later in the discussion, but you know, uh, it was the standard tactic of uh, the particular warlords in Somalia to put women, girls, children in front and attack towards the United Nations forces. Well, immediately they hesitated. Why? Because again, they're trained not to kill civilians. We certainly could have used, that's where we saw the beginning of non-lethal weaponry being considered. We even, I remember uh, sitting in on a meeting about using some type of goo where we would spray on them. And uh, Dick, do you remember this? Where the, they would freeze the civilians in place. Uh, whatever we could do to try to stop this. Now we have some very interesting things that, that uh, there's pulses, there's uh, sound waves. Uh, I think there's one considered where they're going to play Barry Manilow for hours and that would cause everybody to flee the battlefield. Uh, then there's one that I think is amazing uh, that actually heats up 1 64th of your outer skin and makes your skin crawl. And you can't stand it. It doesn't hurt. It hurts, but it, there's no damage. Uh, and people flee. And so there's that particular type of weaponry as well. The, again, all of this is being considered and reviewed to make sure they comply with the principles of the laws of armed conflict. But the bottom line is, is that uh, with civilians all over the place, we're going to have to consider uh, ways by which we limit the casualties on the civilian side. More to follow on that. And of course then, uh, and we're not going to get into this particularly at, uh, during the lunch hour, but just cyberspace. My goodness gracious, the new high ground. Uh, where this goes, fascinating discussions and wait on this because again, we're going to have to deal with cyberspace and what all of that implies related to a battlefield and whether the laws of armed conflict even apply in cyberspace. One of the things that I have found fascinating is the creation of the social network in holding bad guys accountable. They can't get away with it anymore. You know, Mao Zedong uh, could kill 64 million of his own citizens, and we knew very little about it other than bodies floating down the Yangtze River uh, like logs. We figured something's going on up the river. Now, literally, I can just do the video mode link it up, and literally in five minutes, CNN is playing real-time almost a tragedy taking place. So someone saying they're killing us all, and here are the pictures, is a huge step forward in holding accountable individuals. They can't get away with it anymore. They can't hide it, despite how hard they do it. Even China is having trouble. They're working their way around it with technology. So they're truly shining a bright light of justice on these dark corners of the world that we tend to not follow or monitor. And all of a sudden we're watching a tragedy taking place and it allows humanity to react to that. It's instant, it's all-encompassing, and it's global. So, with all of that being said, what an incredible time it is to be a part of international humanitarian law, practicing it in some form or another. The future uh, is the future. I'm not going to say it's bright. All I do know that it's important that the rule of law continued to move forward. It may be hard. It may be difficult. But we always have to consider and always hold fast to the law. You know, in those crazy times in this town when planes were dropping into our buildings and stuff like that, I teach my students in my national security law class, you don't push the Constitution away. You take the Constitution and hold it tight to your chest. 
because that's how we're going to get through this. And Colin Powell was right. The threat to this great country is not the fact that a couple of planes go into a couple of buildings. The threat is how we react to it. And with that, I'll conclude my remarks. Thank you very much. So I'm not sure whether there's time for anything other than me exiting stage left uh, or any questions or comments uh, from the audience. Do I have any time at all? Okay. So, Gary. David, the International Criminal Court, your view on its future short-term and long? Okay. <laughs> the International Criminal Court is here to stay, Gary. It just is. Uh, it ain't going anywhere. Uh, in fact, more and more countries are joining it. Uh, the key, particularly from a United States point of view, and we're seeing that. I was head of the ABA delegation to Kampala in June uh, and saw a rather constructive effort by the United States, which is not going to join the ICC in my lifetime. It isn't going to happen. But there is a policy, uh, there's a policy currently in place that we're going to at least engage and support where we can. But I'm here to tell you the Senate will never allow us joining the ICC. It won't happen in my lifetime. But there's nothing wrong with us staying engaged with the ICC. So the International Criminal Court is not going away. Uh, it is slowly but surely, like all tribunals and courts, developing its own legs, developing its own abilities. Uh, and so I think uh, uh, it won't be perfect by any means, but it will be here to at least be the depository of all this jurisprudence from Nuremberg, Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Cambodia, all of this jurisprudence and these procedures are all going to be captured and they are captured and followed by uh, the appellate chambers of the International Criminal Court. They will be the bright and shining light of at least reminding us that mankind is better in the 21st century than we were uh, in the 20th century. But you're not going to see the United States a part of that, which is sad because we were the ones that actually created the whole concept. We were the one that fought for Nuremberg. You know, if you remember, uh, Winston Churchill said, let's just round them up, make sure they who they are, and take them out back and shoot them. I mean, that's a quote. Joseph Stalin said, well, not so fast. Let's try them, and then we'll shoot them. Uh, but it was the United States. I, I can't remember where France was on this. But... But the United States is the one that said, we're going to subject these individuals to the rule of law. And since then, we were cornerstone in creating Yugoslavia, cornerstone in creating uh, Rwanda, a cornerstone in creating uh, uh, Sierra Leone, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, the tragedy of all of this is since we've chosen not to be a part of now the modern ICC paradigm, the Roman paradigm, we're, we're outside players. And all of this talent in this room and elsewhere in this country are largely precluded from actually being a part of this. You know, we're about to change prosecutors. We're about to change deputy prosecutor. Uh, judges change all the time now, et cetera. This, the talent that this country has to assist in advancing the rule of law internationally is incredible. And all we are is sitting looking in the window as this all takes place. And I think. That's a sad commentary for us, how hard this country has worked in advancing modern concepts of protecting people on the battlefield and prosecuting people who violate those principles. I don't know if I answered it specifically, Gary, but I think I made my point. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure that uh, the indictment of, Charles, of uh, Omar Bashir has not yet worked. It's just a matter of time. Uh, it took, uh, when I signed the indictment of Charles Taylor on the 3rd of March uh, on 2003 in my office in a ceremony, along, among others, uh, I actually didn't have him handed to me until uh, March of 2006. It took three years. Uh, Omar al-Bashir will be handed over. Uh, it's just a matter of when that politically and practically make sense. And what's important about this is uh, he knows it. Or we have to come to a crossroads and say, if we don't, then why have an international criminal court? 
you know, we're, this isn't a, you know, we're in for a penny, in for a pound. We can't do half measures in law. You either did it and, and you'll be prosecuted for it, or then if we're half enforcing the law uh, on some people and not the others, uh, then I think that the rule of law is going to be questioned by peoples around the world. So I'm optimistic. Uh, Taylor was just the beginning of taking a, an individual and prosecuting him. It took time. It took a political effort. Uh, I spent the last two years of my uh, time there, 70 percent of my time, building political momentum to have him turned over, uh, which obviously uh, is. Same thing will happen to Omar Bashir. Uh, it's just a matter of time. You can quote me on that. You can call me and say you're right, or if I'm wrong, I'll buy you a beer, Dick. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last. Uh, I think that it'll it'll continue to be what it is. It'll be challenged uh, uh, by the particular current circumstances and state of the of the world at the time. Political, and I mean, the, that particular statute. Uh, the cornerstone of that is is cooperation. Uh, at both ends, and uh, it's going to be circumstantial. I'm not sure if that gives you the detailed legal answer, but uh, that's just the kind of the practical thought that I have based on your question. Well, look, I'm being giving the, the hook. Thank you very much. We're going to take a, a three-minute break for everybody to stand up, stretch your legs. We're going to reformat the tables here so that we can have a vibrant roundtable discussion or a V discussion uh, in a minute. So thank you to Manuel and Hector for helping us with that. We'll reconvene in three minutes.